First question from my friend Greg. Did you get one of those YouTube plaques? Check it out. Let's unbox it together real quick. Nice little foam pad here on it. Sword was inspected and packaged with great care by Rick. Thank you, Rick. A letter from the CEO of YouTube. Do you remember your first subscriber? Your hundredth? Your thousandth? I do remember getting to a thousand subscribers and then 10,000 and now a hundred thousand. I don't remember the hundredth. And then there's the award itself. Get this out of the packaging here. Presented to Siebert Science for passing a hundred thousand subscribers. Ooh, and it's got a mirror built in so I can sit there and just stare at myself in the mirror and bask in my newfound glory and fame. Pretty cool milestone to hit, um, and I wanted to do a Q&A, kind of answer some questions and stuff in honor of that. So thank you all for being here, for subscribing and everything and supporting the channel, and uh, let's answer some questions. And stay tuned to the end, I'll share the second plaque that I got after reaching 100,000 subscribers. Let's put this back here. There we go, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? If a wizard forced you to transform into one body system of your choice, which would you pick? Skeletal, muscular, nervous, etc. This is from my brother-in-law, Jim. Thanks for sending this question in. I think I would go with nervous system. Nervous system's always kind of been my favorite system. Um, I also have a spinal cord injury, and so the nervous system is very relevant to me. It's damaged to the spinal cord, or technically the cauda equina, or these like branching nerves that come out of the bottom of the spinal cord in the L1, L2 region of the vertebrae. There's also a panel in the comic book Watchmen um, where there's a, a nervous system like moving through the kitchen and it makes sense in the t context of the of the comic so i can I'll, I'll already have a visual of like if i was just a nervous system walking through the kitchen what is your favorite enzyme i don't know that i have a real favorite enzyme but the answer that came to mind when i was teaching anatomy and physiology to high school uh, students i would always when we talked about the digestive system and we we're talking about chewing food in the mouth and the saliva and we talk about this enzyme salivary amylase and i always made this stupid joke that Amy Lace, I, I thought it was a cute little girl's name. If I, if I ever had a little girl, I'd name her Amy Lace after Amy Lace. I always made that joke, and I made the same joke about the cerebellum in the brain. I thought cerebellum would be a cute little girl's name. Spoiler alert, I do have a daughter, and her name is not Amy Lace or cerebellum. Oh, a question for my wife, Carol. Which video are you most proud of making? I'd say I'm most proud of making, and this is not my best video or even that good of a video, but when, I, when the pandemic first hit and we went to virtual learning, and I decided I was going to get back into making videos because I'd made a few for my students, but it had been like a couple years at that point since I'd made a video. And the pandemic hit and we're moving to online learning. We're asynchronous for that last quarter of uh, the 2019-2020 school year. And I, I got really frustrated because I was trying to record this video that I needed to get done that night so that my students could watch it. It was a physics video about projectile motion and it wasn't working the audio wasn't syncing up right with the recording and I was using this recording software that wasn't all that great. It was just bad and I got really, really frustrated with it and I was just, I don't know, I was I was mad. And so I almost quit. I was just like, this is, this is stupid. I'm not gonna make any of these videos. And I don't know, I took a break from it. I eventually kind of went back to it and decided to give it another try. I tried the video again. It, it worked. I was able to make that video. And so once I made that one, then I was like, all right, I wanna keep making some more. But just getting over that hump of like, this isn't turning out the way that I want it to um, and kind of sticking with it. That's maybe the one of the ones I'm most proud of. It's not my favorite video, but just proud of sticking with something, you know. I used to think of myself as somebody who didn't finish projects, who didn't stick with things. Um, and I've really kind of changed that narrative with myself after talking with my wife some about it some, some number of years ago. And I always view myself as somebody who starts creative projects and never finishes them. Like I tried writing a book and I tried, you know, whatever the thing is and, and not getting done with those things. But now... I don't know, I, I have stuck with a lot of things and um, seen them through to the end. And so I, I definitely think of myself as somebody now who, who who does creative projects and finishes them and sticks with them, which is an important identity shift for me. Next question, oh geez, come on, Sam. Uh, this is my friend Sam from college. Says, can you please explain in detail what Birdman is? And you can see some, uh, you see a laughy emoji there and some other people laughing at it. So basically what Birdman is, is in college we had this silly game. And so the way that it worked was if you Birdman somebody, it means that you, you did this. So you do this, and if somebody looks at you, then they have to get down on the ground, and lie down on the ground for three seconds. I, I don't know why, just that's that's what that's what it was. And so you'd always be going around trying to birdman somebody. Also, Sam, if you're watching this right now, I expect you to get down on the floor for three seconds because you just got birdmaned. So you get down on the floor for three seconds, and you get back up. But you can block a birdman by, by putting up your monocle. So you put up your monocle, then you can look at somebody who's doing the birdman, but you're blocking it with your monocle. The other thing is if... If you're bird manning and you're not paying attention, somebody can come up and hit you in the armpit. And if you get hit in the armpit, a couple things happen. One, you get really humiliated because 
you're just very vulnerable when you're doing this. You know, your armpits are exposed. And then second, you can't Birdman again for, I think, 20 minutes. So this was just a silly game that we played in college, but it was a lot of fun. And there were definitely times where, like, I'd have to get down out of my wheelchair and lie down on the ground for three seconds, like, in the, in the middle of the hallway or something. So, um, Sam, thanks for that question. Next, here's some questions about kind of teaching and what I do as my day job. First one says, well, you are so interesting and so are your videos. Thank you. What do you do? I've been in education for about 12 years, and, and I taught... First, I taught anatomy and physiology and a bunch of other classes. I've been in the same school for 12 years now um, and really like it there. And now I'm a dean of curriculum and instruction for the STEM department at my um, school. What that job title means essentially is that I work with teachers. Um, I do observations. I give them feedback and coaching, that sort of thing. I just help them to be the best teacher that they can be. So I do that. I also lead professional development and I help make other academic related decisions for the school. I still teach a class, I teach AP Chemistry right now, I think I'm gonna teach AP Physics next year. Um, so I don't teach Anatomy and Physiology right now, even though I'm still making Anatomy and Physiology videos. Question from my friend Kat, at what age or stage in your life did you realize you were a born teacher and how did you figure it out? This is a great question, I don't have time to go all the way into the story, but I was in college and I was on an engineering path, I was an engineering major and I, and I liked being an engineering major, I liked the classes I was taking. I ended up in this service learning class uh, this humanities class to fulfill my humanities requirement. And I, I didn't even want to be in that class specifically. I signed up for a medical ethics class, but then it got canceled. And then I had to sign up for a class last minute and there wasn't much left. So I ended up in this class. At the end of the class, I was writing this research paper and I had to write a research paper on some of the social justice issues that I dealt with in my service that I had done as part of the class. So I was researching about education and I started reading all this stuff about the, uh, the achievement gap or they call it now the opportunity gap and realizing that, hey, not every person in the country gets the same quality of education. I'd never really thought about it that way. I just assumed that everybody went to a high school that was just like the high school that I went to and everybody had the same experience and I realized maybe that's not the case. And, and so I had this moment where I realized like, oh, here's something that exists that's unfair that I can work toward helping out in education in some way. And, and back then I was probably more like, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna you know work toward a solution and make everything better. And now I kind of realize that the, the scope of educational inequality is pretty big and I'm not some savior coming in to, to fix all of that. But at the time at least, I was like, here's a problem that is worth solving that was suddenly very exciting to me. Whereas engineering, I just got into engineering because I liked math and science and I didn't even know what an engineer did. I don't think I would probably enjoy being an engineer personally. That's kind of how I realized that teaching was the route that I wanted to go down and pursue. And here I am many years later. And also I did, um, I stuck with the engineering major, ended up doing Memphis teacher residency. I've got a mug right here that I'm drinking out of. Um, so that's how I got into teaching as far as my teacher training program. Majored in engineering, did Memphis teacher residency, and then here I am still teaching. Oh, for my friend Lindsay from college, she says, as I'm leading a discussion group for graduating college seniors, I've yet to tell them about life deciding parties, but I might need to this week. How did you know you needed to leave the engineering career path and pursue teaching? So I kind of just answered that question, but life deciding parties was a fun thing that we did in college. So our friend group, as we were becoming seniors and about to graduate from college and go off into these different paths and directions, also just talking about this is like making me nostalgic. I need to like reconnect with a lot of these friends like Sam and Lindsay um, from college, we started to have these things called life deciding parties. And so once somebody figured out, hey, after I graduate, this is what I'm gonna do, we would throw a party for them. And mostly it was Lindsay throwing the parties, I think, and probably got some help from, from some of the other people. But once I realized, hey, I'm gonna get into teaching and I applied to these teaching programs, I got accepted into a couple of them, I decided to do Memphis teacher residency, then they threw me a party, you know, and I, I had like a cake, I think, that had like some Memphis themed stuff on there. I think there's this image, I don't know if I can find it or not, but of me photoshopped on like Elvis's body, like my head and Elvis's body. Just a fun thing that we did whenever somebody figured out, hey, this is what I'm gonna do with my life, or at least what we think we're gonna do with our lives, and we'd throw a life deciding party. Next question from Origins and Insertions, love the anatomy name there. Uh, if you had to teach one subject to university students for the rest of your life, what would it be? Ooh, man, I, I think anatomy and physiology probably. I really enjoyed teaching anatomy and physiology. It's probably been my, maybe my favorite class to teach. It wasn't always my favorite subject, but I've enjoyed teaching it. So maybe be, maybe that. Um, I also love to teach kind of randomly like a creative writing class. I took a creative writing class in college and really enjoyed it and never thought of myself as a writer or a creative person back then. And since then that's changed. I enjoy writing fiction, even though I've not done so in a while. All right, some questions about my process in making videos. My friend Amy says, when and how do you get your ideas about a new video to make? 
lesson planning, looking through textbooks, social media groups, and seeing many AP students and teachers struggle with living in the human body, kind of all of the above. I don't really have a set process for it. Recently, I started making videos about different synovial joints in the body. So I did a shoulder joint, elbow joint, hip joint, wrist joint, knee joint, still need to make an ankle joint. For those videos, I was kind of like going through the list of all the joints and those videos were performing pretty well. So I just made a lymphatic video that did really well. It, it kind of depends on what people are asking for. I get a lot of comments saying, hey, can you make a video on this? And so I might choose one of those to make a video on, or sometimes there'll just be like a hole in the content that I've put out. So like right now I'm working on a, a cardiac conduction system video or, or an ECG electrocardiogram, like the heart sounds like the, you know, that you see in like movies and stuff. So I'm working on a video of that, but that's just cause I'm like, hey, I don't have a video on that aspect of the heart yet. There's a gap in my kind of content that I have. Let's work on that. Um, how do I explain these things so easily? And I've got two answers for this. One, I don't. If you saw the actual total amount of footage and takes that I take whenever I'm making a video, you realize like, hey, okay, he kind of struggles through these explanations a little bit. If I make a 20 minute video, I'm probably starting with 40 minutes of footage and I cut out about half of it of me starting to explain something and messing it up. I think I'm an okay public speaker here and there, but definitely not um, perfect at it. Um, 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 and I stumble a lot and say wrong things and have to stop and rethink about things. That's one answer. The second answer is I've got a lot of experience teaching and teaching really forces you to learn things at a deeper level. As a student, I would always learn things just enough to like do well on the test. But as a teacher, you got to learn things enough so that you can just like straight up explain it to other people and answer their questions about the topic and rearrange the information where you can present it in a logical order. And that's why one of the, when I talk about how to learn and good study strategies, one of the best study strategies is to, to try to learn this stuff and then work on explaining it to somebody else because it works. Teachers know this stuff is because they've had practice figuring out themselves and then explaining it to somebody else and then you know it really, really well after that. Next question, how to do this? Hello, sir, I want to do this. I, I think what this person is asking here is uh, like, what's my process? How does it look like? But basically I start with an idea and I first research the idea. So, so let's say there's a topic I wanna do. I've just been working on that cardiac conduction video. So I got out my anatomy textbooks and I start reading uh, what that textbook has to say about the topic and I'll look up diagrams of it. And in a document, I'll just start organizing the information. And that's a really powerful way to learn is to to take multiple resources and compile it down into your own set of notes that you can understand yourself. Doing that helps you learn this stuff really, really well. Like I know the cardiac conduction system really well, but when I started making this video, I just knew it a little bit, kind of forgotten most of it, but this process of taking information from multiple sources, consolidating it down into one document is a really powerful learning tool. So I do that first and then I work on a diagram. So I go through and I draw out everything that I'm going to be talking about in the diagram and I do it in different layers. So I use an iPad app called Procreate and in each different layer on that drawing app, I've got a different part of the diagram that I'm gonna animate in one piece at a time. I export that to my MacBook and I use Apple Keynote. And so I upload all those images to Apple Keynote. I add the labels and everything and I do all the animations in Apple Keynote. Actually works really well as like an animation software for the kind of stuff that I'm doing. And then I go to the recording phase. So then I'll record it. I'll set up my, my phone, microphone, lights and everything. I do a screen recording as well as recording the video of me talking. Then I send those both to my computer now that I'm explaining this, there's just like a lot of steps to it, but I send those to my computer and then I'll edit it in Final Cut Pro or I'm also exploring CapCut a little bit as editing software. Then I'll export it, I'll create a thumbnail, I'll upload it to YouTube, and then that's when you see the final product. So whenever you watch one of these videos, just know that there's like tens of hours going into each video, even if it's a 10 minute video. This process is not quick. I wish it was quicker. There are quicker ways to do it, but I think I would be creating a product that I wasn't as proud of. So I like to take all these steps and, and create a really good video that I'm proud of at the end and hopefully provides value to people that are that are watching it. All right, now we're moving on to an easy question from uh, my friend Larry, Mr. Siebert, can you please explain the meaning of life? And there's some laughing emojis there. Everybody's answer to this is different. It's gonna depend on your view of life and your faith or, or your beliefs about the world and, and all of that kind of thing go into this, answering this question for yourself. But I've got an answer that I wanted to share that I think maybe applies to everybody I think I got this from um, Mark Manson's book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Beep. The idea is that life is full of problems. Everybody has problems that they have to solve. Now, some people have very challenging, life-threatening problems that they might be solving. Some people have very easy problems that they might be solving. Some people have problems that they don't want to solve, and some problem, people have problems that they 
and joy solving. And so I would say like one potential answer to this meaning of life question is to find good problems that you want to solve and enjoy the process of solving them. I, I think about this, you know, this idea of, of people that win the lottery and they win the lottery and suddenly they've got millions of dollars and they don't have any more problems to solve. But you hear these stories of people that win the lottery and then they lose all that, they go and blow all that money really quick and they're unhappy. They have high rates of depression, maybe that sort of a thing, but they just won the lottery. What, what gives? Well, I think maybe part of that is suddenly they're like, you know, they're working toward these goals maybe that they had or, or working, they've got some problems that they're working on solving. Suddenly those problems are all gone and they got nothing to do. And so when I think about, you know, what I want to spend my life doing, I don't want to just sit back and watch movies all day. That sounds like a lot of fun maybe, but maybe for like a day and then I would kind of be bored of that and I would want to have some other work to do. You know, the, the, the idea of retiring excites me. But it doesn't excite me because I just want to sit around and do nothing. It excites me because then like if I retire, then I can work on all the other projects that I want to work on, um, making videos or writing, writing stories or whatever the thing might be. So that's my, you know, my meaning of life answer that I have right now that I wanted to share um, in this video at least. All right, some questions about why anatomy, physiology, and biology and stuff. When did I start gaining an inclination towards biology? I, I never really liked biology all that much. I'm really more drawn to um, physics and chemistry, especially. Chemistry was kind of my first love as far as subjects in school. And then, so I did my teaching program. I got certified to teach math and chemistry and physics. And the job that was available, they were hiring for anatomy, physiology, and actually government and economics. They needed somebody to teach both because they were adding 11th grade that year. The school was still pretty new. So even the anatomy and physiology, I was like, I wasn't sure if I was going to take the job. Well, I don't, I don't know anatomy and physiology all that well. Ended up going in for the interview. And at the interview, I thought I was applying for anatomy and physiology. They let me know that it was for government and economics. And I was like, I really don't know government and economics. Like, you know, I voted before, but like, I don't know. I don't know the ins and outs of that. I ended up taking the job and I just taught government and econ that one year. But anatomy and physiology, I really kind of fell in love with teaching it. And one cool thing I like about anatomy and physiology specifically is there's this never there's never this question in my mind or in students' minds of like, when am I ever going to use this information? Like we're literally learning about the body that you're living in right now and how it works. Like, of course, that's important information to know and helpful information to know. So I never got that question teaching anatomy and physiology. And I was always teaching them about things that they could relate to in some way. Yeah, I, I just I just really enjoyed that process of teaching anatomy and physiology. So it was really by teaching it that, that I kind of fell in love with it. And now I love learning about the body and how different things work. What field would I pursue if not biology? I don't know, probably another science maybe. Or at this point, I, I've really enjoyed just learning the aspects of video production. Uh, I, I'm laughing a little bit because I'm looking around. I got this like my studio set up with these these makeshift foam things to try to make the audio a little bit better. And I got my my lights and my all this kind of stuff that I just never would have thought I would have been doing. Maybe I would study something related to film production or audio or um, art. I think like learning how to draw would really help with my with my diagrams and stuff. Hey, my friend Drew from school that I haven't, I haven't seen Drew in a long time, but I appreciate that he's asking a question and following along with this. So what got me into STEM? Yeah, what got me into STEM was I just liked math and science. How I got into biological engineering, which was my major in college specifically, is I read a popular science article about a guy who had lost his arms in an electrical accident, and then they made him a prosthetic arm that he could like control with his like the nerve endings that were left still. And so he could send signals from his brain down to there and like control the movement of the arm and stuff. And I was just like, that's super cool. I would love to work making technology that would help people and improve their lives and stuff. So that's what made me interested in biological engineering. And then, but through that process kind of learned that like, maybe that wasn't the, the field for me. Advice for students contemplating going into the sciences. The advice that I would give is learn how to learn. A lot of people go into sciences and then they, they don't do well in their classes and they have to switch to something else. So I'd say learn how to learn well, learn how to study, look up videos on how to study and how to learn, like go on YouTube and type in how to study or how to learn well. And there are so many videos and just soak in all of the information and then try it out. Try it out while you're still in high school. And if you can do that, then you can be successful in science classes. And if you don't ever learn how to do that, then, then you're really going to struggle. So that would be my advice is learn how to learn. It's the most important thing that you can learn in school. And for me, I didn't learn that until I got to college because in high school, I never had to study or, or work that hard to, to learn. But then I got to college and suddenly like we were moving quickly through the material and I got a one out of 10 on my first honors calc two quiz, a one out of 10. I'd never failed a math quiz or an assignment in my life. It's only a one out of 10 and I had to like sit down 
and I, and I had to start going to office hours and I had to, I had to spend hours figuring out how do I learn this material that I hadn't learned by just sitting in the lecture. Whether or not you're you're smart or not, or whatever that means, you, you gotta learn how to learn well if you wanna do well in college science classes, or if you wanna make YouTube videos on anatomy and physiology content, learning how to learn comes in handy. All right, these questions are more about kind of goals and monetization and where I'm, the direction I'm taking the channel. John, I forget who this is, um, now that I'm a celebrity, says, uh, what are you gonna be doing with all this newfound fame? Will you remember us peons and not get caught up? In your, in your celebrity. Obviously, I was joking there. This is my friend John, one of my best friends. I don't even know how to answer this question. Like, I'm not, definitely not famous. Although, I will say, um, I did get recognized at a National Science Teachers Association conference a year or two ago. I was waiting in line to see somebody much more famous, Paul Anderson of Bozeman Science. And uh, we're waiting in line, and somebody behind me, this lady says, Hey, are you the guy from Seabird Science? And I didn't even know, I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's me. I didn't even know how to like interact with somebody who recognized me from the channel. That was kind of a cool moment. I think that's the only time I've been recognized in, in public or whatever. But it was also at a science teacher's um, convention, so it kind of makes sense. There's another question. Oh, geez, not this. Okay, story behind this. How many times should one use a bath towel before needing to wash it? Maybe we could do an scientific experiment to study the bacteria over time. So John's just messing with me here. So growing up, I, my mom just washed our towels after every time we used the towel. And I thought that was just how everybody did it. I mean, why would you question those things when you're growing up, right? We just assume that the way my family does it is how everybody does it. So every time we used a towel, it would get washed. I got to college and I had this rack of many, many towels. Um, you know, I don't know if I had 10 towels in the, in the rack. And John saw it one time in, in college, we were in the same dorm. And he was like, why do you have so many towels? And he was giving me a hard time about it. But then I kind of got my uh, got my revenge a little bit. Well, not revenge, but I, you know, I, I kind of got my my moment when John, who I don't know if he brought one towel to college, maybe two, he came by and uh, his towels were all dirty, and he said, "Justin, can I borrow one of your many towels?" And I was like, "Look who comes crawling back, needing one of my towels." Suddenly, you're not giving me a hard time about it now, John. Anyway, that's the story behind that comment. Another one from Brian: What three factors or tactics do you think got your YouTube page this far? I'd say one is um, just consistency in making videos. Um, and, and when I started the channel, I didn't even think about it as starting a channel. I, I was excited to do a flipped classroom model in my classes, which means that like students go home and they watch a video of their teacher explaining a topic. And then in class, instead of sitting through a lecture, they could spend time like working problems and doing practice with the teacher giving feedback on it. So I was excited about that and I needed a place to host the videos. So YouTube was a way to host the videos. So that's why I started the channel in the first place. I wasn't trying to monetize or make this into like a career or anything. Like that stuff wasn't even on my mind. Um, but I made a lot of videos um, in the pandemic. You know, the, the pandemic era really helped with that because I had this kind of extra time and there was a little bit more of a need for it. And so I started making videos then. Um, and I just made so many that, that it kept growing. So I'd say one thing to anybody who's starting a YouTube channel or creative endeavor is to just do that thing a lot and keep getting better at it um, and not necessarily expect that it's gonna be like financially beneficial initially. And for me, I didn't get monetized until um, I'd made you know 80 something videos. And even then, when I first got monetized, I was making about a dollar a day. You know, it ends up being about 30 bucks a month. Even then I wasn't, I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a little bit of, <clears throat> a tiny bit of extra income. <clears throat> a tiny bit of extra income, but you know, it's not going to be anything. And then now it's grown quite a bit and I'm making a substantial amount um, that, that's been really helpful for us. All right, continuing plans for world domination, future goals, classes and Skillshare. Basically, what are the future goals for this channel and everything? So I've got a couple things going on right now. Obviously, the bread and butter of this is making anatomy videos. That's what I know will earn income um, and grow the channel. So I'm going to continue to focus on that. I've also got a Patreon page. On the Patreon page, I share diagrams. So all the diagrams I create, I put those on Patreon where people can access those um, in one Google Drive. And so I've got the blank diagrams. I've got filled in diagrams. I've got a couple study guides on there. Other resources that I might make, I'll post those on the Patreon. And then other behind the scenes updates and stuff I post on there. So um, it makes a little bit of extra income, which is helpful to pay for you know my video editing software, help me upgrade audio and stuff. So that money kind of goes toward building the channel up and, and, and leveling up a few things there. You know, link in the description if you want to support the channel, of course. I'm working on my first sponsored video with this company called Anatomage. Um, I'm really excited about that. I'm also in talks with a company called Anatomy Warehouse about getting some anatomical models that I can use in videos. Um, so I'm kind of exploring the the sponsorship, brand deal, um, that kind of side of things, which I've kind of enjoyed looking into that more and watching videos on that sort of thing. 
I'm in talks right now with um, a guy named Jack um, who runs Positive Physics that I've used in my physics classes and chemistry classes about doing some kind of anatomy stuff. So we're working on developing kind of anatomy questions to go along with my videos and integrating those on their platform potentially. We're kind of just exploring to see if that's going to be something that people want or find value in. So that's a project that um, I'm kind of working on with them a little bit. I don't have any plans for classes in Skillshare or that sort of thing. The idea of creating a whole class worth of content feels like a lot, uh, especially if I put something behind a, a class paywall, that means I'm not sharing it on the YouTube channel where I know it will make some money. Um, so I don't have any plans for that right now, but maybe in the future, if I'm able to scale this thing up a little bit, um, that would be something fun to do. So yeah, those are my plans for world domination going forward, I guess. A couple questions about other video interests. Can you make a video about space repetition? Yeah, so she's referring to this idea that instead of just learning something all at once, you actually learn it better as far as your long-term memory goes. If you learn it and then wait a little bit and then you review it again and you wait a little bit and review it again and you kind of space out your practice. All of this stuff about how do we learn better is really interesting to me. I read a lot about that with my job as Dean of Curriculum Instruction. I've led some PD on some of these topics. Um, I haven't made any videos about them yet, but I'd love to have like a video series about here's how to learn A and P well. And I think that would maybe hit well with my audience and, and they would watch those videos. So that's something I want to do at some point, but I haven't sat down to make those videos yet. Oh, and then my brother-in-law says, is there any non-science content you'd like to get into making more of? Yeah, I, I've made a few other videos. I actually made a, a video with my brother-in-law, Jim, about uh, as a how-to video on how to play set, um, the game set, and he's super good at it. Link in the description if you wanna see that video, but something like that. I love just having an idea of like a random video to make and not having to think about like, is it gonna do well on the channel? Are people gonna watch it? just having a cool idea and making the video. But I feel I feel the pressure now a little bit with this channel that like, I don't wanna make too many videos that are kind of off topic because uh, what if that, I don't know, hurts the algorithm and my videos don't do as well, I don't know. There's all these things I'd love to share more of if I had more time. But right now, like I've got my day job and my family and I spend a lot of my like free time or time in the evenings and stuff working on videos and stuff. It's why it takes me like a month to make a video sometimes. Cause I'm literally trying to squeeze in all of this into the extra time that I have in my life. But if I got to a point where I was doing this full time, then I'd love to spend like kind of the extra time on these fun side projects of doing vlog style or disability stuff or creative, creativity related videos, that sort of thing. So I'd, yeah, I have other non-science content. I'd love to make videos on. I just, I'm prioritizing the science content right now. Oh, and the last thing is I mentioned this thing about getting two plaques. And so this, the thumbnail was a little bit misleading maybe, but it is true. I hit 100,000 subscribers. And then in the same week, I got two different plaques. The second plaque wasn't for the YouTube channel though. The second plaque was I got um, an award for wheelchair basketball. I was the best class two in our most recent wheelchair basketball tournament in Nashville. It's been a long time since I won an award for, for sports, for being, for being good at a sport. The first time was when I was like maybe 11 or 12 and I was playing at like a junior prep league wheelchair basketball tournament. I got an award then, all tournament team. And then playing wheelchair softball, I got best tournament shortstop um, at the national tournament, the division two national tournament when I was in high school. And then I think this is the first time I've won an award for the, for our personal award. Um, since then. And so I was the best class two. And what that means in wheelchair basketball, you have different classifications based on disability. So let's say that I had a, I had a high spinal cord injury that affected like movement in my hands and I had worse balance than I do, then I would be a class one versus if let's say that a, somebody that's a single amputee below the knee. And so they still have all of their ab muscles and, and, per, and, and perfect balance and everything, then they would be a class 4.5. That's the highest class. So everybody's got a, a disability classification that they have between one and 4.5. And so for me, I'm a class 2.0. So yeah, so that's just like a fun thing um, that we got awarded for. And even more important than that, um, our team got first place at this tournament. And so that'll help us in our ranking as we're going to nationals. We're, we're preparing for the national tournament right now. I didn't talk about it in any other part of this video yet, but I play wheelchair basketball and that's probably my other like main hobby. So it's a lot of fun, but our team's going to nationals and uh, proud of them. We, we did really well in the tournament. We had a lot of close games. We had two games that we won where we were down for most of the game, um, but we really stuck with it and we didn't get discouraged and we kept fighting through. And our team was able to make some clutch plays at the end. We we're able to, to do a full court press in both those games to kind of work our way back. Uh, ended up on top, played against some really tough competition. We played against a guy um, on, the, on a team from Arkansas who has climbed Mount Everest 
He was the first amputee to climb Mount Everest. Um, he was also like a Paralympian back in the day and stuff. And we we're playing some great teams and uh, we're able to win. So this was a lot of fun. Got a couple, a couple of fun awards. But all that to say, um, don't worry, I'm not going to get a big head. I actually have lots of self-doubt in any creative or sports endeavor that I do. And I have to kind of give myself a lot of positive self-talk to fight those like negative things. So just to get a couple awards or recognition is, is pretty cool. To, to those of y'all out there, um, thank you all for watching this like super long video, um, but also just for being part of this journey. If we don't know each other personally, uh, I appreciate you being here and I, I wish I did know you personally. I wish I knew a lot more people because people are really cool and everybody has their own unique stories and things that they're going through and learning and life experience and everything. So thanks for being here and learning about my life experience a little bit and uh, hopefully I can learn about your life experience and stuff too. So um, yeah, thank you all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.